my name is Tim Pyle. I'm the executive director of the International Pyuresis Association. And one of the hot topics all across the socials is uh, about the breath hold method. So I thought it'd be great to just have a little conversation with one of our breath hold experts, Dave Kliss, who is a board member of IPA and uh, he's just a great resource for all of our members. So good morning, Dave. Good morning, Tim. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Um, like I said, you know, we get a lot of questions about the breath hold method and I, you've been using it for some time and I thought it'd be great to kind of hear about how you got started using it and what some of your experiences are. Well, sure. I, I started um, recovery about 10 years ago using graduated exposure and because of traveling in airports, which was a huge problem for me, I needed a backup plan in case that didn't work. And so at the time I was using self catheters, which is an invasive process. And while a lot of people use them, I really didn't want to use it much. And actually I didn't end up using it at all. It was kind of a safety blanket that I carried with me. Um, but then when I discovered breath hold, it was, it was a good way to replace that. And so I began to use breath hold as a, a backup plan. And that was about six or seven years ago that I learned how to do it. Um, I also wanted to educate myself about it because we, I, I'm a support group leader and there were guys in the support group that asked about different aspects of recovery and what they could do. And I wanted to be sure that I had some firsthand knowledge about breath holding in order to answer their questions. Yeah, I think a lot of times, you know, when we think about our pyuresis, it's super frustrating and we'd love to have like, uh, people want to know about tricks and they want to know about, you know, kind of quick fixes. I get the impression that you know, it's a really helpful technique, but there is practice, just like graduated exposure, there is practice to to really make sure that it works and, and get used to doing it. Well, you know, there are advantages to all three, you know, if, it's, if you, and they basically there's the three methods of recovery. Um, there are other things that help, but these are the ones that are recovery. There's the self, there's the self catheter, there's breath holding, and there's graduated exposure. And there are advantages to each of them. If, if you use um, a self catheter, it's immediate, it works every time. Um, and there's there's only a small amount of training and you're, and you're ready to go. Um, breath holding, once you learn it, um, you, it works every time, but there is a process of learning it. And um, and some guys make it through that process and, be, and learn how to do it. And others go through the learning process and say, this is just too much and give up. It, it is it is um, it is a an uncomfortable process. There's no doubt about it. Um, but once they learn it, it works every time. Uh, graduated exposure is the most natural way to recover, and it, it allows you to pee normally. However, it, it takes support, it takes help, and it's a, it's a longer process. And so some, some people who have a more immediate need will look for one of the other two. Talk us through a, a kind of what your approach is to using the breath hold method. So I'll, I'll tell you what I do. I'm not going to say it's the absolute way it needs to be done, it's, but, but it's what I do. Um, and it has a lot to do with first re relaxing my body and then allowing that de deprivation of oxygen to, to force the bladder muscles open. The thought process is a huge part of it as well. Um, and I think with those people who don't make it through to learn it, probably it has a lot to do with what's going on inside their head. Um, because when I first tried to do it, I, I practiced a lot on, how, on hold my breath a very long time. And the object is not to hold your breath a very long time. The object is to pee. And there's two differences in those objects. And, and I think that a big mistake is making in, in focusing on holding your breath a long time. Um, so when I successfully learned it, what I did was I took a deep cleansing breath and then I let it out, relaxed. Then I took another one and let it out and relaxed. And then on the third one, I let almost all my air out and then just stopped as, as I got to that point. And I let almost all of it out. And then I just stand there and wait. And I focus on what's happening to my body. And then I start to count to 100 because I want my mind to be occupied by something other than how long is it taking. So when it worked for me, I counted slowly to 100, not at a particular pace, but just slowly to 100. And, uh, and as, as, it began, as I began to get farther along, I began to feel my throat constrict. And I had this guttural, this need to make guttural sounds in my throat, kind of uh, uh, sounds because that was my body telling me I needed to breathe. And my diaphragm began to convulse uh, for trying to force my lungs to breathe. Wow, that, that sounds uncomfortable and may, maybe a, a bit disconcerting. Um, those convulsions and, and, and those constrictions in my throat, they, they tend to happen well into the process. So there's a certain amount of time that I just have to stand there waiting. And that's when I do the counting up to 100 because that keeps my mind occupied with that. Um, so I'm thinking that it happens those convulsions probably happen about 40 or 50 seconds in. 
I guess you have to really get used to and, and just get through that, right? And instead of being alarmed by that, I tried to recognize that as a good indication that my body was at work trying to make this happen. And so I've worked my way through that, let myself endure that. And then all of a sudden, it started to pee. Now, some people talk about a pelvic floor drop, that they can feel something happen inside. Doesn't happen to me, it just, it just starts. But it's getting through that throat constrictions and the, and the di diaphragm convulsions and, and make, letting my body kind of fight against itself for a little bit. That that seems to be what the, the the process that ends up. Some of the guys I've talked to, they they have this feeling that they're they're going to pass out. Um, but you're right. If if you begin to feel like you're going to pass out, obviously you need to stop. There there are some physical you know things that you don't want to go through because if you pass out, you could hit your head and those kinds of things. So uh, you want to be careful with it. But um, but your body is pretty self protective. It will tell you when it's getting to that point. What do you find in the work you're doing about the success rate for this? We hear it's about ten to fifteen percent. I've been taking informal polls, and from what I've seen, you're about right. It's in the ten to fifteen percent range that people successfully learn it. We don't know why it works for some and not for others. You know, it could be the mental the mental process getting through that fear, or it could be that just some bodies work differently than others. It would be fine, inter really interesting to see some, some actual medical studies that tell us what's going on. What other kinds of information do people who chat with you about this ask that maybe we haven't talked about yet? Is there anything? Well, one of the biggest questions is how do I, how do I keep the flow going when after I start to breathe again, because um, when you've deprived yourself of oxygen for a minute or more, there's kind of this intentional, unintentional gasp to start air again, and that causes a contraction, contraction in the diaphragm and the abdomen, and sometimes that shuts it off. And so the key there is to to, to know you're going to gasp and not and, and intentionally try to take air in as softly and, and as calmly as possible. Um, so that's one of the biggest questions I've had. What about the secondary pyuresis aspect? The idea that we're standing there, we're going through this process and maybe thinking that people might be looking at us, you know, which we know isn't true. One of the uncomfortable things about trying this is the thought of having to stand for so long at a urinal or a toilet without making any noise, without obviously peeing. And it's, 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 it's hard because you're very self-conscious, you know, and those kinds of thoughts can enter your head. Um, so, so we have to get past that mentally, that idea that I'm just standing there. And that's one of the, one of the, the things that has to occur. As guys get more used to it and they're more confident with it, they, um, they don't sometimes need to hold their breath quite as long. Some guys get past that by starting to hold their breath before they even enter the restroom. So that by the time they get to a urinal or toilet, they've already held their breath for a certain length of time. So there are ways to accomplish, but it is one of the things that has to be taken into account. That's awesome. So without uh, uh, any names, can you share a success story of somebody that you've coached and how this has helped them? Yeah, there, there was a, a wonderful success story. It was a young man in high school who was pretty much tethered to home because his own bathroom was the only one that was safe. So he could only be away from home for maybe two or three hours at a time. And um, we be, I began to meet with him weekly and we talked about the three options and what would work and what didn't. Um, but the fact that he was so young and so tied to home, he needed something really, really immediately. So we first explored self catheters, but he found that the process painful and, and uncomfortable. And, and then we, we worked on breath holding and he worked on it for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden it worked for him and I didn't need to see him again. I mean, he, he was away from home for 10, 12 hours at a time, going about his business, talking about getting a part-time job. Um, his family returned to normal life. Um, so the breath holding was life-changing for the entire family. Now, he may, he may explore graduated exposure at some day, or he may continue breath holding for the rest of his life. It works for him. And so wonderful. It was a, it was a fantastic success story. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, just create this short video with us. Uh, again, if folks have questions, they can always uh, reach out on the pyuresis.org website. You can send an email to get info at pyuresis.org and uh, we'll be happy to connect you to resources about the breath hold method or any of our other resources that we can provide. And um, we hope to hear from you soon. Dave, thank you so much. You're welcome, Tim. Good to see you. Good to see you. Bye-bye now. Bye.